Would you bet on your courage? That's how I make my living. I still own that house. It's been boarded up ever since that night. I will wager you $10,000 that you will not be able to spend one whole night alone in that house without being frightened to death. Twilight Pwn, the internet's third most popular Twilight Zone podcast. My name is John. I'm joined by my co-host, Fred. How you doing this week, Fred? Hi, I'm doing well. How about you? Doing good. I was just thinking, you know, it's true we are the internet's third most popular Twilight Zone podcast and all, but uh, that's not always been the biggest badge of distinction, but it's, it's kind of nice that I think we've held on to that, even though we've kind of stopped having a podcast, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think we've got a lock on third best. Definitely something I I drop at cocktail parties. <laughs> I mean, Sharon held on to the number one pole position for like eight years, so. <laughs> Fair enough. So what are we talking about this week, John? So we finished our run of the Twilight Zone, so we've been kind of hip-hopping all around different Sterling adjacent related materials. Uh, we've done a couple night gallery episodes. We are returning to that well. We will be discussing the night gallery episode. And in the weird way of night gallery, this episode has two segments. Uh, where we will primarily be discussing a question of fear, but we will also take a little time to talk about the other segment in there. The devil is not mocked. And this is the second season of night gallery, the 12th episode of the season, aired originally on October 27th, 1971. Good evening. And welcome to the night gallery. Now, if you'll just follow me. Time again for your weekly excursion into the cultural. Painting, statuary, still lifes, collages, some abstracts, and some items in ice. That's not the technique. That hopefully is what we turn your blood into. A good way to begin the attempt, painting number one. About a man who spends a night in a haunted house an unbeliever, if you will, who by dawn believes. The name of the painting is A Question of Fear. The name of this place is the Night Gallery. I just have one note written down on Rod's <laughs> intro. Bad is <laughs> my one note. Some items in ice, which is a thing we hope to turn your blood into. <laughs> what? What was that, Rod? I just feel bad for Rod. I can just see him sitting in his chair waiting to tape his bits, thinking like, I had an Emmy at 28. What the <laughs> hell happened? Like, there's a real that ought to hold the little SOBs feel. Like, structurally, it's not that different than the Twilight Zone intros, but like, and yes, the Twilight Zone could do horror or sci fi or, yeah. you know, it could do like genre heavy stuff, but like, when Serling did his intros for that, he always seemed like this cool character, kind of otherworldly. Like it just, it, it felt very cool. And when he does this, he just kind of seems like a, I don't know, like a chiller theater host. Like yeah. there's not a whole lot of difference between him and Sven Gulli in these. <laughs> That's a high bar right there. Well, <laughs> we like to do our own past his prime Serling intros. <laughs> I kind of feel like I went first last time, so you're up. All right. Okay. Tonight's tale features the three crucial elements found in all great drama. A staggering sum of simoleons, a horrible haunted house, and a prickly privateer with an eye patch. Soon the latter will enter the former to obtain the foremost, but not before the four ordained forty minutes of foreboding for ear. There's also some dumb shit with a vampire on tonight's episode of the night gallery <laughs> what is simoleon i mean i know it means money or dollars but what, what the heck is that is that like an ethnic slur that we don't know about <laughs> <laughs> there is some etymology apparently it's not a settled okay uh, you know idea of sure, where it came yeah. from but uh it is believed according to wiki to be a late 19th century mac macaronic what does that word mean I gotta look that up. <laughs> Wikipedia uh, stuff with Fred and John. <laughs> Holes blend of si- Simon, which is dollar from sixpence coin. It's basically like some kind of weird French Creole, Creole thing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. I'm sure there's like some kind of racist connection if you <laughs> dig deep enough. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, here's my Sterling intro. Greetings, art lovers. Today's masterpiece is a study in fear, reminiscent in style of Vincent Van Ghost. Henry Bousseau, or Joseph Mallard William Terror. 
<laughs> and what could be scarier than a haunted house? If Halloween season local radio ads are to be believed, absolutely nothing. And tonight's haunted house is a doozy, full of thrills, chills, and special effects that probably looked pretty okay when we first filmed this. <laughs> Of course, any time anyone enters a haunted house, one must ask oneself whether its intentions are pure. Is this an honest fright fest or merely part of an elaborate and frankly absurd revenge plot that involves World War II, biochemics, and fake old man hair dye? The answer can be found during normal visiting hours at the Night Gallery. <laughs> Not as much etymology in that one, but... Uh... Anyway, uh, we're uh, about to get going with a whole uh, palette full of spoilers. So if you want to avoid that, check out this episode, which you can find on Hulu. Um, I think you have to pay for it. and You still have to watch ads, which is annoying, uh, but you can find it there. And it's also on Daily Motion. <laughs> um, they, they very okay. cleverly like to avoid like getting scanned by copyright robots, just like reversed the film. So it well, not reversed it, but like mirror flipped it. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of places that do that, and some places will like speed it up by like five yeah, percent or something. Exactly. Just... So if you want to watch it backwards yeah. at double speed, check it out on uh, Daily and Motion. I will say I have returned the DVDs to the Allegheny County Library system. <laughs> okay. So if you want to, you know, anyone who wants to do that, yeah, that's all, an option. all six thousand of our listeners from Allegheny County <laughs> can check it yeah. out. Um, before we get going with the plot, though, I wanted to ask you, you know, all Night Gallery episodes start with, you know, the Rod Serling intro, and he, he points out a painting that's supposed to represent right. the episode. This one is like, like an illustration of a cat and a dead mouse. What did you think of it? If we're going to talk about more of these, which, you know, we'll probably, you know, I don't think we should get the annual pass to the no, Night Gallery, but so. we'll, <laughs> yeah. it's not going to be worth the, the yeah. bang for the buck. But yeah, we'll yeah. probably go every now and again. Yeah. No, I, don't, I think uh, we're going to be I, paying full price. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I think I, I should probably spend a little more time thinking about the the painting in question. I, I don't know. It, it didn't really connect with me. All I wrote down is that it's a bad 70s drawing. <laughs> so clearly I, <laughs> I didn't have like a fantastic observation lying in wait. I was just kind of wondering if you did. Yeah, what I was thinking of when Sterling's doing this intro is mainly that his kind of medium to fat sized tie just depressed me. <laughs> okay. You know? It's like we're not in this, the early 60s yeah. anymore. He left yeah. the skinny tie far behind. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. His tie had put on weight. He's He's got like what... <laughs> the what, hair's shaggy. Yeah. The suits are brown. It's just, you know, it's 70s. <laughs> yep, it's the 70s. And indeed, it is the 70s uh, when our story opens up. Mm -hmm. There's a man uh, played by Twilight Zone alum Fritz Weaver. He was in uh, mm -hmm. The Obsolete Man playing like the evil state representative guy and probably in something else too i know he was at least he's in uh third from the sun oh, playing the right. kind of drunk guy <laughs> right jerry <laughs> that, <was> a very <laughs> interesting thing. <laughs> that one still does make me laugh i'm not gonna lie that's you uh, know about all i remember from third from the well there's actually it's funny you know just having our little take on all these like yeah. i'm sure that good twilight zone fans think of different things from third from the sun like the the air of, uh, I don't know, oppressiveness of the state, and are they going to, the tension, are they going to make it out? And I just think of, like, what was it, lemon cake or yeah. lemonade and cake? <laughs> lemonade and, like, and drunk cake. guy in <laughs> one line to read. <laughs> we all get different things from the Twilight Zone. I knew there were no such things as ghosts of evil spirits. I made up my mind I would spend the night in that house and put an end once and for all to all the stupid legends. Against the advice of my friends, I went there just after sunset. I have never been afraid of anything in my life, and I give you my word, I was not afraid of that house. They found me wandering on the road sometime after midnight. When I went in there, my hair was jet black. It was this color when I came out. He's kind of like a bottle old man. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a... <laughs> It's very fake looking white hair. I, I feel comfortable saying that. <laughs> we'll learn more in as the episode yeah. goes, but like you kind of you can tell he's like leaning forward in his seat to make sure he doesn't, you know, touch the back of the chair and some of it will wipe off yeah. there. <laughs> like, I know he's like going to like a David Lynch theme party later or something like that. But yeah, it's 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 very fake white hair. Speaking of fake, like yeah. what is that accent? Yes, I think we later yeah. learn that it might be Italian, but yeah. <laughs> it's like 
I guess it's from somewhere in the eastern part of Europe, but yeah. Italian wouldn't have been my, like my fourth guess. Yeah, he just kind of, whatever it is, he went like 55% into it. I just get the feeling that in the 70s, like the director was like, I don't know, you're from Europe, just roll with that. You know, it's barely there. Anyway, he's he's telling this this story about a haunted house that he he owns in some sort of a gentleman's club type of place. So yeah, this is actually kind of a cool shot. You know, it starts with a close up on him and his fake hair, uh, and then we pull back and we pull back and we pull back and we see that he's talking to two you know gentlemen at this gentleman's club, uh, and then we pull back and we pull back and we pull back and then we see a pool table and a guy's about to make a shot. He succeeds at that shot but it definitely made me think like how many takes did that take like <laughs> it just wouldn't quite have the same impact if the guy fluffed the shot you know what i mean <laughs> and then you could sort of hear like damn it off camera you know? <laughs> but the guy who uh, who made the trick shot <laughs> um, mm-hmm. is uh a colonel played by leslie nielsen it's not just leslie nielsen it's you know they the director just told the makeup and costume department just have fun with him you know <laughs> Just pull out all the stops. He's got like an eye patch. He's got a seventies mustache. He's got a gold tooth. He's got a parrot on his shoulder. <laughs> he had he, he, all those things are true except for the gold tooth and the parrot. He he just mm-hmm. he uh, he's he, got very un Leslie Nielsen ish dark hair. That's true. Noted. That's true. Yes. Yeah, I did have a hot or not for him. What do, what do you think about this? Mm-hmm. Kurt Russell as Snake Plissken. Well, I mean, in in the sense that he has an eye patch. I mean, <laughs> as a man who owns a Snake Plissken action figure, I'm <laughs> okay. gonna say it takes a, a lot to get to that level. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know. It's the most <laughs> Leslie Nielsen has ever looked like Kurt Russell. <laughs> That's, That's fair. That That's fair. <laughs> All right. What's his actual name? I just wrote down Leslie Nielsen a bunch of times. Colonel Dennis Malloy. His character is that he doesn't like fear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't have a clip of this but it's like yeah. his first lines he's got a real gym coach vibe yeah, <laughs> it's a real like of. only the strong survive <laughs> <laughs> like yeah it's it's, it's kind of weird like if someone is telling you this like story about how they spent the night in a haunted house and it like it almost you know scared them to death like my first reaction isn't like I hate fear. (laughs) (laughs) That is basically his reaction. We get a little bit of backstory about this Colonel Dennis Leslie Nielsen Malloy. You believe then, Colonel Malloy, that you are without fear? When I was 18 as a volunteer in the Spanish Civil War, I killed my first man in hand-to-hand combat. Since then, I've been with the armies of Britain, United States, French Foreign Legion, more recently the mercenary in Africa. I have seen and done things and were I less of a man, I too would have white hair. No, I am careful, but I am incapable of fear. That's Pretty my cool. motivation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you think you're incapable of fear. Well, why don't you spend a night in my haunted beach house? And uh, <laughs> Fritz Weaver suggests a bet to make things more interesting of ten thousand dollars or inflation calculation should throw like a wah pedal over that for the 70s (laughs) night gallery edition (laughs) yeah and i hope you did adjust this to 1971 of course john okay good i'm a pro i've 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 calculated emila delmonico's (laughs) <laughs> it's $61,256 in today's money. And I didn't even actually do Crazy. this calculation. It doesn't but, seem but, like inflation's that bad. That's that's a lot of difference. I guess these were the Carter years. I don't I don't know what to... What <laughs> no, to, no, a little earlier than that. Yeah, yeah true, uh, true, true, true. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. We were in for like decade of first inflation, then stagflation. So, yeah, I guess so. We'll talk about that later on our economic history podcast. Yeah. You know, all of these calculations are done by Googling inflation calculations. I don't exactly check these numbers necessarily, but I think it's yeah. like roughly right. It's certainly a lot of money. And another guy who's in the club tosses an extra five grand, which is, I guess, roughly another $30,000. So this is $90,000 in today's money just to spend one night alone in the haunted house without... <laughs> That'll buy you dying. a lot of AMC Gremlins back <laughs> yeah, in 1971. Exactly. Sure will. <laughs> you can shag carpet every room in the house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Next, we cut to uh, the colonel arriving at the haunted house in the 
the middle of day for night. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, I did actually make this note. Like, yeah. do you think Midnight Medford was just rolling in his grave <laughs> yeah. watching? The, like, I'm sure he just was disgusted. Yeah. The problem with day for night is if you inadvertently see the sky. You can't do like a long shot day for <laughs> yeah, night exactly. of like a building, you know, alone in a field. It's, yeah. It's pretty tricky. Yeah. Day for night, in case listeners don't know, is it's the practice of filming during the daytime to make it look like it's night by changing the experience exposure settings on the camera and obviously it makes things cheaper if you don't have to film your movie at like four in the morning but the problem is it can kind of work but if you see the sky the sky is still blue which it's a darker blue but it's still blue you know i actually like started thinking about this i wonder if midnight medford had problems when color yeah well sure like changes everything yeah because I, I wonder if he was, like, one of those actors who couldn't adjust to the talkies. <laughs> like, like, maybe in black and white you could maybe futz around enough to, like, yeah. make that shot work. But I, I don't know. I think that's... <laughs> yeah, there's a like lot a... of shots where it's, like, it's a dark, scary night, and it's clearly, like, three in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> exactly, yeah. Anyway, he goes inside, and he's sort of poking around, and the door shuts mysteriously behind him. And then a bunch of community theater actors jump out. Right. It's a very mysterious push it closed with your leg. Because <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's slightly out of frame. It's terrifying. I also like his classic mercenary getup of the yeah. unbuttoned dress shirt, gun in the slacks combo. He kind of looks more like he's... Yeah, like he's dressed for like a it casual looks like safari. Me at the end of the workday. He doesn't <laughs> no, really... It's not an unbuttoned dress shirt. It's like a safari jacket, basically. Is it like a jacket or is it an unbuttoned shirt? Men in their undershirts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. He, he's definitely like a casual trip to the haunted house. That's for sure. Well, he does. Yeah. I am right that he's just got the gun like shoved in his pants, right? Like <laughs> you'd think a mercenary would maybe have some sort of holster. Yeah, he's like, I'll just stick it's it all, in my britches. It's a little slapdash, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm saying. Enough. I don't know. Maybe he's just cocky at this point. You know, he survived six yeah. wars. I guess he thinks like a haunted house is NBD. He's poking around. There's spiders. I think blood mm-hmm. falls from the ceiling at this point. It's like the little bowl of peeled grapes to be eyeballs. Yes. It's it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. We see like a kind of cool disembodied head that it, he doesn't actually see the disembodied head, does he? Right? It like appears and then disappears. I don't think he does. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is this is good stuff. You know, it was either well, this or the haunted hayride and <laughs> <laughs> and Colonel Leslie Nielsen is glad he spent his money here. I think it takes something away from the terror with the floating head when I, I couldn't tell what the hell it was supposed to be. It's not digital because that's the yeah. era, but it's like, I don't know. It's like a Tronish effect or something. It's not your traditional yeah. scary ghost. So I, yeah. I just was confused more than terrified. Like a hologram ghost? Like a Tupac right. hologram right. ghost? <laughs> And the fact that the guy didn't notice it that kind of yeah. takes some of the terror. But We got to commercial and we get back. Leslie Nielsen is poking around the dining room. Treating it like an episode of House Hunters. Kind I mean, of, yeah. If you were going to spend the night in a haunted house, I, I feel like I'd just hunker down near the door. And just yeah. make that home base. I, I, I kind of wonder. It's like, that. oh, this yeah. house is so scary. It's so terrifying. Like, I'm not going to go check out the basement. I'm going to be yeah, like, all right. Exactly. The rules say that I I just have to be in the house. I'm going <laughs> to stay in the foyer. Yeah. Well, I don't know. That's a very, like, John move. It's like <laughs> sticking to the letter of the law, <laughs> maximizing the profit return of this haunted house excursion. But I do agree. There seems to be some sort of, like, unwritten clause that, like, you not only have to spend the night in the haunted house, but you have to like, you know, wander <laughs> yeah, around the quickly find the creepiest part. parts. Yeah. yeah. It's like what? you have to like lock yourself in the closet of the haunted house. <laughs> so he's wandering around and he uh, pulls back a curtain and instead of a window, he sees a brick wall, which echoes mm. a kind of a, a moment from a, a Twilight Zone episode. Do you want to care to venture a guess which one? Was it the one where the guy is on Mars in the yeah. zoo? Yeah, it's that one. That People called? are like all called? over. People are, like, all over. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I was all really, like, cockily ready to say that it was Fritz Weaver in that episode. But it turns out it wasn't. <laughs> it was Roddy McDowell. So, uh, so yeah, there, the connection ends there. And did you notice right after he finds the terrifying bricked-in windows, yeah. 
suddenly there's like lightning outside and the lightning flashes go across his face even though apparently there's no outside light source well that was like, one wall of windows <laughs> i couldn't tell if that was just stupid or if like that was supposed to be weird and unsettling that like lightning flashes uh, were coming in even i though... don't know i think that was just stupid you know honestly like i could pretty much sum up the next 20 minutes of the episode by saying leslie nielsen wanders around a haunted house because there's a lot of like little things to touch on but basically he's just wandering around a haunted house yeah it's got all the terror of an episode of fixer upper yeah. <laughs> my mind kind of started to wander i was just thinking like more philosophically about horror movies like mm -hmm. if i was in this haunted house i certainly would be very scared but like i could not be less scared watching this you know what i mean <laughs> And it's like, what? well, I think that partly the writing, but partly the directing, like, you know, it's all yeah. pretty well lit. It's, yeah. There's probably not a director who could make this scary for the like 25 minutes that it lasts. But yeah. like, I think a, a good director could probably make this scary for about, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes. But, but isn't there like just, something yeah. kind of interesting about the fact that like seeing a character like going through a scary set of circumstances isn't necessarily scary to the viewer? You know what I mean? Like, well, I mean, that's what I would say. Where yeah. it's like a failure of the directing. Okay, I think like yeah. the directing, their job is to connect the like scary situation and make it resonate with the viewer. And this yeah. is like a scary situation for the person in the scene, but it's not connecting. Or I think we both, we personally don't believe it's connecting. So I think that's on the director. Well, anyway, Leslie Nielsen, he picks up like a candelabra and. Then he gets a flashlight set up, which makes me wonder why he even needed the candelabra, but whatever. I had that note. <laughs> yeah. I thought maybe he's just trying to confuse the ghosts, throw them <laughs> off the trail. Like, yeah, I, don't I don't know. know yeah. What do you feel about candles? What's, do you employ candles for any anything in your house Fred. at all? Fred, come on. What? You know me. What do you think I think about candles? I think you think they're an unnecessary fire risk. <laughs> Absolutely. I. We sometimes, like on holidays, yeah. they come out. I understand their place but it is my <laughs> preference to have them lit as as for as little time as possible as necessary people who light candles for like romantic yeah. you know mood it's like i can't really enjoy the mood because i'm just concerned they're gonna tip <laughs> yeah. over and start a fire i definitely so. imagine your light your wife kind of like romantically lighting a few candles and you just standing there with the fire extinguisher <laughs> just being like okay we're gonna give ourselves seven minutes of ambiance <laughs> and put these out i'd be i'd be like okay but we need to put them in like a glass enclosure <laughs> and like maybe put a little you know fire retardant fence around it and then i can maybe take breathe easy <laughs> yeah yeah Understood. Uh, i don't you know. know you know i just moved into a bigger apartment here in brooklyn recently and we you know, this is the luxury of all luxuries in Brooklyn, but we have room for a dining room table. And so we've been eating at an oh, wow. actual dining room table uh, over the past few months. And we've been like light candles like every night. So I sort of feel like initially it was like very exciting, but now I kind of feel like the romance is sort of fading and like... I wonder that we're sort of over you just candling. Burn bigger and bigger yeah, exactly. candles. <laughs> like, Eventually, it's going to be like an burning arms man race chasing <laughs> like, that hot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's going to be like a pagan ritual before dinner every day. We get like a fun special effect shot of a neon green ghost, which is maybe you were talking about like you weren't sure yeah. of what was going on with that. But um, the colonel right. at this point sees it and he shoots mm -hmm. at it and we see some like blood on the floor. He doesn't really seem concerned at all. He was in Spain. He was in... France, you know, he's seen hologram ghosts get yeah, shot before. Exactly. Franco's hologram ghosts. <laughs> yeah. He goes down to the to the basement for some reason, yeah. and uh, he lands on a bum step. Uh, the the stair breaks and he falls. <laughs> he doesn't seem hurt at all or to even care about it, but that <laughs> happened. And then he starts hearing some sort of wacky kind of community theater laughing. <laughs> Wipe out. That sounds quite a bit like uh, something we've heard before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe Rod brought in Mickey Rooney for like, a quick cameo. This is in some ways my favorite part of the episode. He wanders into a kitchen 
And mm-hmm. I just I love this beat because it really is just like he's taking a coffee break from the episode. <laughs> it's like really well lit. He's drinking from a canteen. He's like smoking a cigarette. <laughs> You gotta take a little break from the breakneck episode, Fred. You gotta take a breather. I know that he's just like, I guess I better get back to being scared again. Yeah, the, like, they actually filmed like Leslie between camera yes, setups. Exactly. They just filmed him at the craft services table and put it in the episode. It's just kind of interesting the little jump cuts when Leslie was putting his yeah, coffee together. It was like was it felt like artsy. very like. Yeah, it was like very stylish, like, you know, indie movie today would yeah. do that if you're like, like putting together Paul coffee. Thomas Anderson directs Leslie Nielsen's coffee break or whatever. <laughs> it's really weird, too, because it's like, well, what are you trying to convey with those jump cuts? Like, it could be totally reasonable if anything else in the episode also had that style. Yeah. Nothing yeah. else. It's just like this one little moment of, ooh, what's yeah. <laughs> Stop. I don't know. I guess that was like the, a concession to the director or something. But anyway, so after this sort of like artsy cigarette break, uh, Leslie Nielsen hears some, some wacky piano playing. I feel like there's something different between dissonant spooky noises and just dissonant annoying noises. (laughs) And like John Cage, (laughs) John Cage's best piece. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe like something that's a little creepy would be a little bit more like, like have a little more like musicality to it or. It just was annoying. Whereas I think like this sound should have been kind of like. Kind of creepy. I don't know. Unsettling. Well, I think like the classic way to make a creepy old time piano playing thing sound unsettling is to like play a classic and well known melody, but to like miss a couple notes. You know what I mean? Or right. like maybe like get the tune, get it a little out of tune. Yeah, so like or like unpleasant. a na 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 na. You know what right, I mean? Like right. that kind of thing. Yeah. So like. Yeah. So you get that sense of unsettling. But I agree, this just sounds like a cat wandered onto the piano or <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, totally. Like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so he wanders over and, and checks out this, this little avant-garde piano concerto that's going on. And he sees mm-hmm. a, the, the military ghost playing. The ghost then turns around and he holds up his ghostly hands. And his hands light up. Which is kind of <laughs> kind of badass. Like I could see Prince doing that, or like Liber- <laughs> Liberace or something. Like I don't know. It's pretty cool. Like if you saw a concert and you saw somebody like rip out a solo and then hold out their hands <laughs> and they were on fire, that would be pretty effing cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a good image. I mean, it's, it's like when a game of hot potato goes terribly wrong. Yeah. But, it's... <laughs> but that would just be cool. Like if you know, I I can imagine it. I can imagine why a lot of musicians might be hesitant to do that particular well, uh, awesome you'd, stage. You'd have trick. to have like asbestos gloves, but yeah. And the colonel is is a little bit less uh, scared than he was before. So he approaches the ghost and he sees a wire leading um, up to the mm-hmm. uh, the ghost, leading him to believe that the ghost is not in fact a ghost, but mere automaton. And he cut ah. he cuts the wire with a knife, which I found to be a, a kind of stupid move. It ultimately does make the ghost fall over and the flame stop. But like, if you see a big like wire leading up to some like mechanical contraption, and you cut it with a metal knife. You know what I mean? <laughs> that just seems like risky in another way. <laughs> like he just dies by a shock, you know, like electric shock. Yeah, or if like there's something that's like shooting flame. Yeah, and you see exactly. what might be a gas line. You're like, I'm just gonna cut this. Yeah. <laughs> That'll fix this problem. Yeah. But anyway, it makes him pretty cocky, and it makes him feel like, you know, you sort of see it on Leslie Nielsen's face. You know, this is all just a big trick, and so he, mm-hmm. you know, he goes up to a, a bedroom that looks kind of like a, a pretty nice little B and B in the country. And he's going to get his his, uh, night's sleep. And he he finds a little wire under the bed, which makes him laugh. And he cuts it. And uh, (laughs) we we do get quite like a... Just like spraying gas, (laughs) leaking gas into his room all night. I'm ready to sleep. And we do get what I thought was a fun scare shot. A bunch of wires jump out of the bed and and trap him in Mm -hmm. like a a web. And a weird guillotine thing lowers down very quickly. And... uh, 
We cut to the terrifying commercials. I do think the whole like bars and pendulum were not really they weren't haunted house. So yeah. much. it was kind of more like a saw vibe, but you yeah. know, it was cool. And it it certainly was unexpected, but it made yeah. me for a second, I'm like, whoa. And then I'm like, well, wait, is that like haunted? <laughs> so, yeah. Like, it's not exactly haunted if I just threaten you with a knife. <laughs> like that. When we get back from commercials, um, the guillotine thing is sort of lowering itself closer and closer to Leslie Nielsen's uh, sweaty 1970s Adam's apple. You yeah. get a lot of close ups of Leslie Nielsen's like pulsating Adam's apple. <laughs> I, I found it very like. Ugh, like I don't want to see that. Leslie actually addresses this, but I was thinking, like, does he lose the bet if his head is cut off? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he does. Like, yeah. Is what does he, he say? Scared. Yeah. Like, what if he's not scared the whole time? Then, like, does he get the money, but he's dead? Because that doesn't seem like a good trade. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Instead of a haunted house, it's just like a bomb that goes off. <laughs> <laughs> he decides he's not going to be scared, and the guillotine stops. Mm-hmm. And he wakes up in the morning to find the wire is gone, the guillotine is gone, and presumably he's going to be $15,000 in in that era's money richer. And he Mm -hmm. makes his way downstairs sort of laughing and finds a nice breakfast waiting for him. There's yeah. even a, a TV, uh, which turns <laughs> on. His house gives him a continental. Yeah, a deal. exactly. And he turns the TV after he finishes up with uh, Morning Joe. <laughs> the Fritz Weaver show is on. He doesn't have his fake white hair anymore. He's got kind of like normal middle-aged man gray hair. He's talking to the colonel, and they're having like a little Skype breakfast. Remember a small command post you captured along the way? Oh, I captured a lot of command <laughs> posts. Yes, to be sure. But this one had a special significance. Perhaps I can help you to try to remember. Ah, it's your TV program. Thank you. My father was a junior officer in the army of Mussolini. He had been left behind to destroy some papers which were potentially useful to the British. Your advance column cut off his retreat. He surrendered at once. Somehow, you got it into your head that he could tell you when the German invasion of Libya would take place. Uh He was not a brave man, my father. He told you with tears in his eyes that he was only a concert pianist in uniform who wanted nothing more than for the war to end so he could get back to his piano and to his music. So that was a very long clip, so I didn't. Yeah. it keeps going for a while, but uh, you, you can fill in on the rest of the details of this exciting story. Yeah, okay, so basically it turns out that mm-hmm. in one of these wars, I guess it was World War II, Leslie Nielsen very cruelly tortured Fritz Weaver's Italian father by burning off his hands with gasoline, um, which obviously is a real bummer if you're a concert pianist. It turns out that he's like vowed to get revenge on Leslie Nielsen, hence this whole contrivance of the haunted house and, you know, this... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, perfect. So far, we haven't even gotten to yeah, the I know, nuts I know. part, but I, yeah. yeah, buying a haunted house, wearing like community theater hair white, and apparently <laughs> having friends that you've convinced of this because unless they're in on it, yeah. inviting Leslie Nielsen over to play pool and talk about your scary house in hopes that he'll bite and make fun of you for being afraid. So that, like, yeah, it's a perfect plan so far. Let's <laughs> yeah. keep going. It turns out that the haunted house was was merely a, a, a prelude to an even more dastardly scheme because apparently when Leslie Nielsen was having his coffee break from being scared, uh, Fritz Weaver drugged the coffee, thereby rendering him unconscious, and he snuck in and did something even more dastardly. Let's hear about it, John. I, I might not have that particular... Like, okay. I've only got a portion yeah. of this. Okay. Let me, let's me let hear what he's got to say, and we'll maybe fill in the, the dots. Okay. Recently, my colleague and I discovered a way of converting a complex enzyme molecule in the human body until its structure is identical with that of an analyte, better known to you as an earthworm. That's terrific. I'm delighted for you. The result is quite extraordinary. The bones of the body disintegrate without affecting the nervous system or the vital organs until the victim is as near as can be an earthworm, able to move on its belly, but without vertebrae, unable to stand. 
were you having a big WTF right about now? <laughs> yeah. After watching like Leslie Nielsen sort of like Scooby Doo around this haunted house for the past like half an hour, I was just enjoying the change of pace. To be honest, <laughs> it really is just quite weird. It's it's very much like a whole other plot that he's just like yeah. We we this was we, not the turn I was expecting in the last three minutes. Yeah, it's like kind of a twist. Like purely in yeah. that I didn't expect it, but like yeah, I think we can talk about that yeah, more in okay. a second. But yeah, let's finish off the amazing twist plot. Here. Fritz Weaver revealed that he was a, a biochemist, and he and mm-hmm. his colleague had developed this compound that, that apparently turns people into earthworms, which mm-hmm. is is what the average biochemist is is working on. <laughs> Your tax That's dollars trying to work. reduce all this NIH money. <laughs> yeah. That's all it's going to is worm people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> Wake up, America. Fake news. Um, anyway, <laughs> apparently, of course, this earthworm serum, which is a thing Fritz Weaver gave to Leslie Nielsen while he was unconscious. That's a bummer. So much more ridiculous to have to talk about I know. This. I kind of was hoping to have to say either. it out loud. It's like making it real in a way that it wasn't when I had to watch it. Leslie Nielsen is like, come on, that's not real. There's no such serum. And Fritz Weaver is like, no, but there is. My colleague who I developed the earthworm serum is in the basement of the haunted house right now. <laughs> He's not having much fun being as he's a slug man, but go check him out if you want any proof. And so Leslie Nielsen gets up to go, you know, do a little quick fact check on this whole (laughs) slug serum uh, thought. He wanders over to the door of the kitchen area and he looks down and he sees something that we've sort of seen before earlier on in the episode, which is like a trail Mm -hmm. of what I had presumed to be blood earlier on. But now I see is kind of what it looks like, you know, the, the... the trail of slime that an earthworm leaves behind as it crawls. So Leslie mm. Nielsen takes that to be incontro- incontrovertible proof of this yep. rather far-fetched earthworm serum uh, story. And he sits down at the kitchen table and he tells Fritz Weaver, you know what, buddy, you've lost even this because I'm not afraid of putting a bullet in my brain. So even though yeah. technically yeah, you're he- never going to get to avenge your dad's death because I'm going to, kill my what (laughs) (laughs) well he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer he's the the bravest knife in the drawer but he's not the sharpest so he pulls out a gun that apparently still has bullets left even though we saw him empty the gun earlier he puts Uh it he puts it to his temple and shoots and then uh old fritzy delivers the coup de gras after leslie nielsen is good and dead I don't have a clip. He's basically okay. like, yeah, I just made that up. Yeah, he's like, there's nothing in the cellar. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me wonder, like, how many scrapes has Leslie gotten out of by just shooting himself in the head? Yeah, exactly. I gotta wonder, like, was Fritz Weaver's dad like, you must avenge me, my son, but make sure to do it in a really goofy way. <laughs> like, it is not enough to merely kill Leslie Nielsen. You must go absolutely <laughs> ape <laughs> in coming up with weird stuff to get revenge. So wait, did he make like an animatronic version of his dad with flame hands? <laughs> yeah, that's, or gotta, like... that's gotta be psychologically weird. You, you gotta figure like Fritz is gonna be in therapy for a while. Honestly, there's really nothing to tease out. It's just a no. really, really, really goofy like, couldn't have Fritz Weaver just shot him? <laughs> like, like yeah, what, 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 without <laughs> having to get, like, hair dye or, yeah, you know, like... The, exactly. Yeah, he he apparently is a man of means. He could have so easily just, like, kidnapped and killed Leslie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, a hundred of times over instead of going through, I'm guessing, at least a year, if not more, yo, of planning yeah. to get this. The point is that he wanted to, like, not have blood on his hands by having, like... Leslie Nielsen kill himself so people would see like oh he was just so frightened he shot himself to death but it's like if you subcontract out like a robot of your dad like with flame <laughs> hands like I'm guessing somebody else built that it's I don't know. I have like, a feeling was, like the police are going to ask questions. You know what I mean? Was Fritz just like wandering around the house, like making little slug trails? Yeah. Like, oh, I better put one right here. Yeah. And he'll notice that. Like, like, what in the world, yeah, man? I, I, I kind of feel like his dad is looking down from heaven being like, son, 
<laughs> I wanted revenge, but it just so strongly hinged on Leslie Nielsen not walking 15 feet down into the cellar. Maybe there was some sort of contingency plan. Like, yeah. I don't know. Like, maybe that's it. Maybe it was like a no win situation. Like, if he goes down in the cellar, there's like, I don't know, an acid pit or something. But like, <laughs> if it, if nothing, it doesn't seem if like it. In it the seems fr- like Fritz Weaver just rushes into the room with a baseball bat. <laughs> and, like, beats it it really does seem like all yeah. this you know played out exactly as fritz thought it would even though there's like no reason to think that it should yeah like, fred like... if i just tell you and i've given you the serum that will turn you into an earthworm yeah. like like i don't think in my wildest dreams i think well i'm just gonna half-ass tell him this and put some slug trails around and then he'll shoot himself yeah, like that's exactly. if if i'm like a consultant who's brought in on this job yeah. i'm gonna say like you know you're making a lot of assumptions i don't know if you're gonna get this really like growth rate yeah. you're projecting out yeah mckinsey was not called in. <laughs> and you said this i think it's true is the ending i would say is unexpected yeah but it's so disconnected from the plot it's surprising but it's not in any way su- satisfying because it's just like wait what yeah where is like, any of this yeah, coming from it, where we haven't been told that fritz is a biochemist or that's in any way related to anything so yeah. when he's just in the last minute or two suddenly talks about like and i on the side i turn people into worms you're just like huh yeah <laughs> a twist has to have some relation or you know ironic meaning off like the main plot of the episode like well that's it, what it can't just it be a non sequitur you know what i mean a twist yeah is, if it's a non sequitur it doesn't yeah. twist the plot it's just like another weird thing happening yeah you know, like a twist should like upend something like an expectation or something yeah. your understanding of the story that went before <laughs> yeah. when fritz weaver first says i don't know if you knew but i was a biochemist i was just like oh boy here we go <laughs> this is getting weird <laughs> Yes, we saw a slug trail or two before, but that's not enough foreshadowing yeah. <laughs> to connect I, the dots. I, I wasn't even aware. I mean, like, to call, to say that it's like a slug trail, I mean, I it just was, there's some water on the ground. You mean your yeah. mind didn't just go to slug trail? Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway. There is another little segment in this episode. Mm-hmm. It's very short. It's kind of like, you know, a Playboy joke of, of a segment. Right. Here's Rod's intro. Oscar Wilde said something to the effect that if there were not a devil we'd very likely invent him. He serves many a purpose, and this grim-visaged character here is proof of that rather bitter pudding in a story that tells what happens when evil collides with evil. The painting is called The Devil Is Not Mocked. I feel like that's a real encapsulation of Serling's night gallery take. Like... Like, yeah, I think Oscar Wilde said something like, <laughs> yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like, I can't be bothered to pull Bartlett's yeah. off the shelf. Yeah. It's good enough. It's not even just that it's like 50% of his intro is somebody else's words. It's like he's not <laughs> totally verifying it. It's like, I believe somebody once said something kind of like this. And then we cut to a grandfather, kind of like a European grandfather, telling his gra- grandson about what he did in, in the war. Presumably it's World mm-hmm. War II. And then we cut back into this, you know, this memory. Um, the grandfather's quite, quite proud. And um, there's a whole lot of Nazi, Nazi going on. There's a lot of Nazis not Naziing up uh, the, mm-hmm. the screen. It really did make me think they spent like a lot of money on this episode because like the first like two minutes alone are just like Nazis driving around in Nazi cars surrounding an <laughs> eastern european castle and i'm like this costs like 20 million dollars for like 10 minutes of film yeah it really does seem like the 10 minutes of this must have cost like three times the 40 minutes that went before this but because they clearly just filmed that at like a weird like local haunted house <laughs> but whatever yeah. and inside uh there's a guy who looks an awful lot like a vampire uh getting mm-hmm. getting ready for uh, a dinner party and uh the Nazis are, are going to break down the door, but instead this sort of suave vampire-like gentleman invites them in very casually. Mm-hmm. And so the Nazis storm in and they're like, we're Nazis and we're going to Nazi this place up pretty bad. And mm-hmm. instead of uh, opposition, they encounter a, a beautiful banquet. They're suspicious that there's a resistance movement going on, but... Uh, the, the host, the vampire-like gentleman, is insistent that there there is no resistance. And 
they're welcome to yeah. sit down and have a nice meal. So they do. It's almost midnight. They're having some crappy after dinner chat about how once the Nazis take over all of this like backwards, like Eastern European castle S is going to be gone. Uh, wolves mm. are howling. Clearly the vampire like host is, is excited to get to midnight. Some bad fake German is being spoken. And around the stroke of midnight, a Nazi officer falls into the, the banquet hall shot. And all of uh, the guys are dead. At this point, we get the quote-unquote twist of the episode. Useless, General. If the bullets were silver, it would, of course, be a different story. You must forgive my servants and our primitive Transylvanian customs. If it's any consolation, General... This is the headquarters of the secret resistance, and I'm its proud commander, Count Dracula. Sorry. Yep, <laughs> so the guy who looked like Dracula is indeed Dracula. Cut back into sort of like the, you know, the contemporary times, and, and Dracula is, is telling his, mm-hmm. his grandson that's what I did during the war. I killed Nazis. I'm great. And mm-hmm. we cut to like a little plaque. Yep. That's uh, <laughs> that's what happens in that one. And aren't you, glad All right. we, yeah, aren't you glad we did that? I think it's cool that Night Gallery wasn't so bound to like 25 minutes. That's what a story has to be. I like the concept that you can have stories that are like shorter and longer. And, yeah. You know, let it be only as long as it needs to be. But this is another one that felt kind of like the other where it's like, it's just like a little cartoon panel or something that somehow became 10 minutes. I feel like it's got to go one way or another. Like, I don't think it works as a short, like at this level, I don't think this would work at three minutes or like five minutes. I feel like maybe you could develop a movie around it that's probably not going to be a very good movie I can but imagine like, a trashy semi-pornographic movie based around this the set of circumstances <laughs> but yeah yeah I, I don't know it's just at like 10 minutes it just kind of hangs there yeah it's like yeah the idea of well the vampires aren't as bad as the nazis and they're like you know doing their part to help yeah. like allied I don't know. allied vampires are storming across the Maginot line yeah I, it's it's uh, just it's... dumb I, it would have been cooler if like you had any doubt that the vampire wasn't a vampire you know what I mean but like yeah. when you first see him you're like oh that's the guy who went to the ho- store and got a Halloween costume as a vampire right. <laughs> like if they had like tried to like play with your expectations a little bit and made him just seem more like a, a suave gentleman or something like that but like I was genuinely shocked that there wasn't more of a twist. This episode, taken in sum, is like a tale of two twists. It's like a question of fear. It's like the twist has like nothing to do with the rest of the episode. And this one is like has too much to do with the rest of the episode. All right. So let's just move on over to what we do next. Bios and trivia. Leslie Nielsen and Fritz Weaver both appeared in Creepshow, another horror anthology, which was actually directed by one of my favorite directors, Mr. George Romero. Hmm. It's a fun little uh, film anthology. Was but, this um, a funny Leslie Nielsen or a straight Leslie Nielsen? This would have been right on the border. Hmm. Uh, I think it came out the same year as Airplane. Hmm. Um, Creepshow is like... A very knowing kind of tongue-in-cheek horror like it, it goes for scares kind of but it's basically why tales from the crypt happened it's like oh, okay. totally in the ec style um but they didn't actually get the ec rights and like uh romero and stephen king did it together it's it's entertaining it's a little long it's like five segments it maybe would have been a little better at four but it's good the exterior of the haunted house oh is, yeah in fact it's the original Norman Bates house right. facade, which That's apparently cool. is still on Universal Studios, which I think it's interesting because I actually wrote a note when I was watching it of like, 
It's a pretty crappy house. It just looks old. It's not really scary. And I think that's entirely because of the terrible lighting. Like yeah. when I read that, I was like, oh, it's actually one of the like most iconic haunted houses in film. It just didn't really look that impressive when it's three in the afternoon on a nice summer day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's true. Trivia says a question of fear may be the first television drama in which holograms, though never described as such, yeah. figure in the plot. <laughs> I saw that. It was I very wishy washy IMDb trivia that won't commit. Do we think that Fritz created like hologram ghosts? Yeah, that's. To create the but that's the thing ghost, we didn't even really talk about because so much of the episode is that weird like green ghost which leslie nielsen almost never sees so it's yeah. i don't know it, it is kind of like a tupac hologram that he makes but whatever yeah i did read the short story that it's based off of um oh oh yeah good it's pretty much exactly the same i was hoping there would be mm-hmm untold depths it had the um, like worm thing too with like no setup is it that the same it is basically the same thing yeah there there is wow. the same non sequitur i forget if it was no it is an earthworm i think as well um the only difference is that there's like scary animals instead of just like anonymous like haunted house stuff but pretty okay. much pretty much like there's like a gorilla for some reason um it, it's pretty yeah, much budget yeah <laughs> yeah exactly i could definitely imagine like the producers yeah, the reading. line producers is like nope not <laughs> we're doing that we're gonna put a hologram ghost in there this is one sentence from the story that i found to be sort of amusing the character colonel denny is his name instead of Carl dennis denny's buttocks tensed with excitement now that the operation <laughs> was about to start that's all i got mm, okay. um cool. moving on i did it did kind of make me wonder about like the history of haunted houses the whole episode in general because i was yeah. kind of wondering like the first time that somebody like dared somebody else to spend the night in a haunted yeah. house or made a bet apparently the first haunted house story is actually f- written by pliny the younger uh who, all the way back ancient rome and apparently um there was a haunted villa in athens and nobody would live in the house until philosopher athenodorus arrived in the city he was tempted by the low rent and undeterred by the house's reputation so he moved in the ghost an old man bound with chains appeared to athen athenodorus during the first night and beckoned to the philosopher the appar- uh, apparition vanished once again once it reached the courtyard and athenodorus carefully marked the spot the following morning he requested the magistrate to have the spot dug up where the old skeleton, where the skeleton of an old man bound up with chains was discovered, and the magistrate injected him with slug serum, which then made him. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, let's move on to Bios. Leslie Nielsen, we saw him in Forbidden Planet. We talked about him there. He was also in a night gallery segment called Phantom of What Opera. According to his trivia, I I don't know if you can believe this. Says he was considered for the role of Jack Torrance in The Shining, the Stanley Kubrick Shining, which went to Jack Nicholson. Be a very I've never read that movie. anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I know he was considered for Captain Kirk. Um, I think largely hmm. because Forbidden um, Planet. Yeah, because of Forb- Forbidden Planet, because Gene Roddenberry was such a fan. This is Leslie Nielsen on the part of his career when he played almost exclusively villains. Quote. The best part is always the heavy. And the meaner and crueler and the worse you are, the more vicious you are as the heavy, the better the hero looks when he whips you. So the heavy is liable to be a very dramatic, fine acting part. I told my agent at that time, I want to play heavies who are really vicious and cruel and terrible. I want them to know that they're terrible and I want them to enjoy it. It's interesting. Would not, it's interesting to think like yeah. there was an era of Leslie Nielsen where he was known as the heavy primarily. Yeah. And then he like shifted into this, you know, super goofball phase. But. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that he's like a classic heavy in this exactly. He's mostly no. just a guy in an eye patch wandering around haunted house. I mean yeah. he basically gets thirty seconds to tell his character. Yeah, exactly. He's like, I've been in a lot of wars and I'm not scared of stuff. That's it. (laughs) In an hour later, I'll have some more dialogue. Now enjoy (laughs) watching me walk around with a candelabra. Fritz Reaver played Dr. Matsy. He was in Third from the Sun and the Obsolete Man. He was also an episode of the 80s Twilight Zone. Written by Theodore J. Flicker. Story by Brian Lewis. Right. Uh, Flicker wrote hell's bells which we've watched <laughs> yeah. he created barney miller we've talked about him some yeah. directed by jack laird he produced 38 episodes of night gallery directed a lot he was huge on the show kojak <laughs> he played a demon in hell's bells right. so that's that, yeah. interesting 
So uh, I'll run over to the BIOS for the other little bit. I actually have a lot more interesting stuff to say. Do we have any trivia the for the Devil Is Not Mocked? Or I don't have trivia. I do have. I did dig into the IMDb stuff. All right. Um, well, IMDb has reviews, which you know we don't normally dwell on too much. But I did think this was funny. This is from uh, reviewer Jordan Haland. This epi certainly poses a good question. What happens when evil collides with evil, as Serling himself puts it? I grant you that I was sort of bothered by some nitpicky details. The uniforms the SS were shown wearing were wrong for the period, and the half-track was an obviously American one. However, the use of the small staff car and the Mercedes-Benz six-wheeler were very good touches. Francis Lederer was a man totally devoted to his craft, still teaching acting until the very end of his long life, and I was amused by the fact that Dantin was himself a former concentration camp inmate. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. That's dark. Uh, Paul Bearer 22173 had this to say. Spoiler alert! Hank Brandt, who plays Nazis in combat, the Gene Levitt-produced World War II series featuring Vic Morrow and Rick Jason in the primary male leads, played the role of Stender Tartarfuhrer Kranz, von Grun's ill-fated second-in-command in in the segment. (laughs) What? Spoiler alert! The limousine in which Malloy and Madsi arrive at this house is a 1969 Lincoln Continental, and it makes an appearance in several more segments. (laughs) That's not a spoiler. I kind of want to email Paul. I'm bem- I'm delighted and bemused by his misuse of spoiler alert. Yeah. He's right up there with us in Hot or Not. I wonder if he's like in on it. Yeah. Helmut Dantin played General Von Gron. He was uncredited in Casablanca as the newlywed who gambles away the couple's money. He made a name for himself as an actor during World War II playing German soldiers and Nazi villains. Making fun of the actor's name in the 1940s, a popular joke was to say that Helmut Dantin was a German phrase meaning, you have chewing gum on your hat. Dentine was, and still is, a popular American brand of chewing gum. I doubt the popularity I cannot imagine that, that was a popular, <laughs> yeah. that was a niche joke even yeah. at the time, I think. Yeah. Francis Lederer played the Count. Supposedly, IMDb says reprising his role as Dracula from the 1958 film Return of Dracula. I don't know. I haven't seen Return of Dracula, but I'm not really sure if it's accurate to say reprising if you just happen to play Dracula twice. I don't know if it's the exact same Dracula. Yeah, um, I also kind of feel like he's not like when you think of Dracula, you're not like this guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Written by Gene Kearney. He wrote the screenplay for Night of the Lepus, 11 episodes of Night Gallery. He was on a lot of Kojak stuff. He, uh, this was based on a story by Manly Wade Wellman. <laughs> oh, Manly Wade Wellman. <laughs> when did we last hear about Manly Wade Wellman? <laughs> Manly. He wrote the Twilight Zone episode Still Valley. Oh, well, well, so, he or he wrote, wrote a story that was based on. Yes. <laughs> that yes. name alone just sends me into paroxysms of mirth. Just... Yeah. Wanly Wade into the well made man. <laughs> <laughs> He also wrote for comic books, which he called Squinkies, and wrote the first issue of Captain Marvel Adventures for Fawcett Publishers. Later, he would be called into court to testify against Fawcett in a lawsuit by National, a.k.a. DC Comics, about plagiarism of its Superman character by the creators of Captain Marvel. Wellman testified that his editors had encouraged their writers to use Superman as the model for Captain Marvel. Though it took three years, National won its case. Directed by Gene Kearney, he directed eight episodes of Night Gallery. He also played a demon in Hell's Bells. And that brings us to the... Inevitable. 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 MST3K. We like to find connections between whatever we're discussing and the original MST3K. Uh, John, it sounds like we have something. What do we got? Martin Kozlek played Hugo, who I guess was one of the um, probably Nazi soldiers. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank God we just we discussed the the second segment, otherwise we'd be screwed for this. But yeah, yeah, uh, he was in the eighth season movie movie featured in the eighth season, Agent for Harm. Mm. He also was uh, portrayed goebbels in hitler so <laughs> oh, man, nice. always crucial to get a good hitler yeah connection. maybe we'll get to that eventually how does imdb yeah. rate this episode overall 
Again, it's a little tricky since we've got two yeah. segments, but IMDb likes this one. They give it a 7.9. Hmm. So You mentioned it aired around October 27th or something like that. So this was probably right. like Night Gallery's Halloween special as much as people thought about those things, that kind of thing in the 70s. I don't know. It's not very good. Having a limited like repertoire of Night Gallery episodes in my uh, knowledge base, I can't really say whether it's a lot better or a lot worse than the average. It's just hokey, especially where I'm talking about a question of fear. The twist is just, whoa, mama. Like, it's, yeah. it really doesn't work. It's not horrible, though. Like, it's like around yeah. around a five. What do you feel? I think we kind of stumbled upon it. I just think it's not well directed. I mean, yeah. it's I not think scary. The, the, ending, the ending falls on the writing. And, I mean, I guess they relied on the source material. Maybe they should have tried to do a pass on it but yeah. the bulk of the story is a guy wandering around a haunted house yeah. and yeah. it's just not scary yeah and that's the problem yeah I mean, if no, you're I like agree. Yeah. making a haunted house story and it's not scary at all then i think you failed yeah and the other thing is just like i don't know it's a one-liner dragged to 10 minutes so yeah i think five is a little generous yeah i, I agree, I agree. I, but it's not it's not like offensively terrible it's just i think it had goals and to my mind it didn't achieve them am i being unreasonable to think a 70s tv show should be able to genuinely scare me i well, don't the exorcist don't is scary i mean you know that was made well the, the exorcist is like a classic of horror and it's a film but i'm I talking about I, like a weekly television I, yeah, show yeah i hear you but i guess it's like i'm not sure I mean, that I i've ever some... i'm not sure that i've seen anything from 1955 that is scary maybe 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 i just haven't seen the movie but i think yeah. that like it's scariness started in 1972 <laughs> but i but i guess my point is that like i do think it was it is still possible to be scared by something in the 70s like now you see a contemporary movie pretty much you're going to be scared by it if that's what they're going for like even if it's just like jump scares but i think that yeah. like the fact that it's possible to be scared and they didn't scare you i wouldn't be overly harsh on it but i do think they kind of you know bungled it a little bit the only reason i even hesitate on this score is because i feel like we reserved it exclusively for fourth season episodes of the twilight zone but i right. think it's like a right. four like it's just a little bit under yeah. par like leslie nielsen is fun yeah it's like maybe not quite a heavy but kind of the bad guy yeah. and you know it's the acting isn't poor it's just eh. You know, it's just and flame hands is a cool moment. Yeah, no, yeah. it's like <laughs> can't argue with flame kinda, hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think four sounds about right. It's it's not offensively bad, but I don't think it's I don't think it's scary. So if it's supposed to be a scary haunted house episode, then it failed. Four it is. Four is all around from John and Fred. So that wraps up the episode, which I believe was a request from somebody, wasn't it? One of our listeners by the name of Bill requested this one. So thank you very much for sending that in. Thank you other people who have sent in requests. We will hopefully get to them. And if, if other people have ideas for episodes or yeah. movies or things you would like us to talk about, we're getting through them very slowly. <laughs> like that yeah. very slow pace, but, you know, maybe one day. My mom wrote in like a long email based around her memories of seeing Forbidden Planet as a kid, which I actually thought, if, I mean, she is my mom, so I'm biased, but she wrote like a kind of charming email. I, I did think it was a genuinely really nice email. Yeah, it was nice, but it was funny because I don't think he knew it was my mom. So I think, or did you know? I, I was confused. I didn't know at the time, okay, but I mean, yeah. it didn't really change no, the way true. I responded. Yeah. She did a very good job of painting a picture yes. of being like a, a small kid in the era. Yeah. You know, going to see the movie. She mentioned thinking that Anne Francis was like a tart, which I thought was kind of, yeah. <laughs> kind of enjoyable. And the more ridiculous thing that she thought Earl Holloman was kind of a yeah, stud that or was a hard weird. Yeah, she had a crush on Cookie, which was, uh, <laughs> I don't know, sort of question. But no, it, was, it was really cute, the idea of like seeing the poster for a month or two before yeah. and thinking like Robbie's going to be terrifying and then it turns out he's comic relief and like dreading seeing Robbie the robot is just like a funny idea yeah. to have in your head. No, I know, but you can, you can understand it based on the poster because it certainly yeah makes totally it makes sense and, you know, if my mom or anybody else wants to write in um, <laughs> there's lots of ways to get in touch john what are they you can send us an email at twilightpwn at gmail.com you can also get in touch with us on twitter at twilight Pwn. you can check us out on facebook you can check out our website twilightpone.tumblr.com you could listen to us on any kind of podcatcher app, specifically if you subscribe to us on iTunes. If you're over there, if you leave us a rating or a review, we really appreciate those. 
that end, let me say thank you to Ye Houston 72 for his very nice review. Yeah, that was he nice or she's review. very nice review, which uh, you know, for first time listeners here, he points out or she points out they almost stopped listening after the first couple <laughs> episodes because yeah. found us pretty off footing. But yeah. you know, they stuck to it and yeah. eventually were like, eh. I guess I'll listen to more yeah. of this crap. That's pretty much the Twilight Pone listener experience <laughs> defined there. For this little outro segment here, I, I feel like, mm-hmm. you know, you and I are uh, certainly self-admitted really big mystery science theater fans. I think you're a sure. little bit, you know, deeper into that than I am. Uh, right. Although I've certainly spent a good, you know, 2% of my life watching that show. <laughs> so uh, I'm curious, you know, there's a new uh, series on Netflix now. And, you know, right. uh, have, how much of it have you watched? What's your general vibe with it? What's your take on it? I believe I've watched, there's 14 episodes. I think I've watched seven or eight of them. Oh, wow. Okay. You've seen about half of it. So what's your take? I don't want to be rude to anyone who's worked very <laughs> I'm, hard i'm sure I, they're all listening right now. i know and i'm sure this will really affect my ability to get work in the industry yeah, <laughs> if exactly. i come out to it. Yeah. i mean it, it's not the nicest thing to say but my assessment i think i shared with you is i had a lot of ambivalence and reservations and yeah. i'd say it is not as it's definitely not as bad as i was worried but it's n- not necessarily as good as i could hope that something like you know a reboot of the show could be um there there have definitely been some moments that have made me laugh that i've been happy about there's some aspects of the like new version of it that i actually do enjoy and think are like good touches like there's some stuff the little fake commercial breaks are like a pretty good clever touch to you know fit into the netflix world being a like 35 year old who was obsessed with mst as uh you know a kid who's like a six five vaguely hipstery looking person like i think i mainly just felt jealous of jonah ray yeah. you don't yeah. <laughs> like how come he got to be on my favorite show instead of me yeah. i look basically like this yeah. guy but thinner honestly <laughs> like basically like if you took you and me and put us in a blender and like spit out the average it would be that guy <laughs> pretty yeah, much so but you know i think he's genuinely he's he, I think he's good in the thing. Right, um, yeah. I don't know. I think there, it's just, for are... me, the the hardest thing is that the original show, just because it was produced out of, like, Minneapolis, out of, like, a right. local cable channel, and it just had such a ramshackle charm that was not forced or faked. It was just they didn't have any money, you know? Yeah. There, there's something just so, like, specific about that and their perspective and, like, the right. weird, like, quirky combination of, like, obvious, like, fart jokes and, like, weird references that kind of made no sense unless you like you know have like a philosophy phd or whatever right it, it's just it's like lightning in a bottle and like even though it makes sense to remake it because there's obviously a lot of old goofy bad movies it's like having it be like a guy with these two robots and their voices are totally different it, it just feels weird and wrong to me like i have enjoyed some of the episodes and you know riffing on a bad movie like you know there are some funny jokes in it but like it just i i don't know i i feel like a curmudgeon as well but i feel like i just don't i'm just like i don't know the idea that it was all filmed over 12 days and like they kind of brought in you know a lot of people who work in la who you know this is all where it gets kind of ridiculous where like it's like, ooh, you know, you got to listen to it on, on record because it's got a much sweeter sound. Like, I don't know if it genuinely affects it, but, like, if people actually work together over the course of, like, nine months and that's the only thing they do and you develop this, like, camaraderie and vibe and different things, like, I feel like it maybe just ends up with a different feel of the finished product. No, I and, really like, do think that's like, true. Like, one group I, of people yeah. write this and then another group of people show up and, like, film it and, like for some reason there's like puppeteers doing the puppets and different from the voice actors but i like this is like super nitpicky but like the puppeteering seems crappy which like i've never noticed before but like 
the idea yeah. that they brought in dedicated puppeteers and like crow's mouth doesn't move right like I, see this is why we shouldn't talk about <laughs> yeah. this at all crow's mouth doesn't move right <laughs> i yeah it will i immediately become every imdb reviewer yeah. that i mock crow's so, mouth is made okay. out of molybdenum which doesn't have the same reflexive <laughs> characteristic as yeah. steel or other composite metals this is why i didn't want to yeah. talk about it like i am in no ways a reasonable objective person no, and i can I'm only the same. like I'm the same. become comic yeah. book guy about it yeah. so the volume of riff per minute of the movie has greatly increased, which decreases my ability. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, that's hopefully the outro song that you choose is quite long to cover that. Oh, I do like Harmar Superstar. Yeah, I've never yeah. heard of them before, but like them doing yeah. like their own little takes on the tracks is cool. Or like, I don't know. There's there. There are little aspects that are nice. Yeah. So, you know, kudos. I like how you just trying desperately to end on a positive note. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll watch a few more episodes and uh, maybe we'll come back with round two of Crossfire on <laughs> Probably the new MST3K next month. But until then, I uh, will talk to you later, John. All right. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. <laughs>